Good morning. Had a little technical difficulties there just for a minute, but we're 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 ready now. Well, welcome everybody here to our uh, worship service this morning. Here, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, third of uh, March day. Uh, beautiful sunshine, and wonderful temperatures. It just it can stay like this and uh, for quite a while and turn off pretty. Uh, as I always say. Uh, Several things we want to be aware of and want to uh, announce this morning. Um, on our prayer list, uh, Cam Cameron uh, uh, got to come home yesterday. He, he's been in a hospital for a few weeks now, four weeks with the after uh, hurry surgery. The young man has had uh, difficulties his whole life and uh, different things. So uh, we're. Glad he got to come home. He's doing doing good, improving, and so but continue to keep uh, Cameron uh, in your in your prayers. Uh, Don uh, Gillenan uh, came home Monday, uh, and uh, he he spent over three weeks uh, at the Hard Hospital, then some time at uh, Chambers and Rehab. So we're glad to hear that he's got to go home, but continue to keep. Uh, Don and, and Sharon in your in your prayers. Uh, uh, Bob's uh, wife Shirley was diagnosed with a, a leaking uh, uh, aortic valve, and so looking maybe at surgery in June there. So please keep uh, keep Shirley happy in your in your prayers. Uh, <clears throat> John uh, McCourt, uh, John went to the hospital Sunday night. Uh, like he was here with us last week, and went, uh, he was fused, had weakness in his uh, ex extremities, wasn't able to uh, speak there, and his blood pressure went extremely high, and uh, had everybody worried. Uh, and uh, but he. Uh, Come Monday morning, he was doing great. When I got there to the chambers Monday morning, he he was laying there and he got up, sat on the edge of the bed, and then he got up and walked around and was just doing really good. And he just called me, uh, uh, and he's doing much much better. I'll get by and see him this afternoon, but uh, he wanted to send his wishes to us. Uh, but can keep him in your prayers uh, also. Uh, also, I was made aware that uh, Linda Mitchell has, is at uh, Mitchell's uh, in in Danville, at least for the time being. So please keep Linda Mitchell in your in your prayers. Uh, we also want to know that uh, next Sunday, just so we all know, we're going to spring forward uh, on our clocks. Uh, so uh, so be aware of. Uh, be aware of that, so you won't. I see you have to put. It, if you didn't do that, you'd be here an hour early. I think that's where you, where we would be with that. Uh, so be aware and change your clocks next Saturday night, and uh, be ready for that. Uh, also, there's some cards out on the table in the foyers for different folks. Please stop by and sign those. And uh, we uh, also uh, be be aware of that. And uh, ladies, did y'all get y'all's bulletin? Did y'all get the? Yeah, good, good. Uh, Andre and started printing out a uh, children's bulletin, and it's got different things. And I will make sure y'all have gotten y'all's bulletin. Okay. We have some visitors here with us. Several visitors here with us this morning. We're glad that you have. We want to invite you back anytime that you can be here with us. You're our welcome honored guests this morning we we love we love company so please come back anytime you have and speaking of company we have a guest speaker this morning uh bert standridge from uh, uh land of nod up there north of dover uh, i told him I, I knew where that was and uh, we're glad to have him with us to speak with us to us this morning in our our worship service look forward to hearing what he has brought uh, uh to us uh, also, I want to make everybody aware, next week after our worship service, we'd like to have this a congregational, short congregational meeting, about 10 minutes, 
kick that white that reason for that but Kevin's going to do the speaking so we can keep it at 10 minutes instead of me and uh, uh, so uh, this couple of things we would like to go over and where we're at and what and things that we want to plan forward and uh, get it so everybody's we're all on the same page we're all in agreements you know uh, I, I can think I have good ideas but we have a whole congregation with good ideas and we want to make sure we always tap upon them too so is there anything else that we need to be aware of yes oh yes thank you Gary yeah uh, Ruatan uh, scholarship dinner for across the street is uh, what tell me the day again is it is it the 23rd next Saturday next Saturday next Saturday the uh, 9th okay uh, so uh, Gary's got tickets that's a wonderful oh and has always been a wonderful uh, thing that the Ruatan Club does for the Western Yale County High School seniors, all the scholarships, and there's several of them that get funded through that, and it's uh, it's one it's wonderful, and uh, they put on quite a spread. They always have, and so please uh, participate if you can in that. Next, it's next Saturday. You get it's twenty twenty five at the door, and twenty if they if you buy a ticket. If I got that right, twenty two fifty. Twenty two fifty. Y'all don't want me as your spokesperson, I can tell already I done undersold you. <laughs> okay, please, please be aware of that and support that if you can. I mean, it's always a great, great thing. Is there anything else? If you know any little ones, make sure you check a church bulletin for them. Oh, yes, uh, it, any they bulletin. Know. If you don't got a, a little one, a grandchild or whatever, take them a bulletin. There's little puzzles, there's little things to draw and all kinds of stuff on that. So take one. That's, we want to use them. We don't want them set. Okay. All right. If, if nothing else, we'll turn it over to uh, is it Jared today. Yeah, Jared for a song. Set. No, Mark. Mark, excuse me. Mark for a song. Set. Each and every one of you this morning here. Welcome to the Western Hill Church of Christ, and we are so glad to see each and every one of you this morning. If you would, please your, turn your song books to number 959. Number 959. Just a little talk with Jesus. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It laid my heart in love and wrote my name above, and just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. He Hear our faintest cry. Answer by and by. Feel the little prayerful yearning. As your heart unto heaven is turning. Find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I have my doubts and fears. My eyes be filled with tears. But Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer. He knows my every care. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. Hear our faintest cries. Answer by and by. Feel a little prayer for your needs. Heart unto heaven is turning. Find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Number 853. Number 
After this song, Brother Jerry Pryor have us lead us in a word of opening prayer. <clears throat> Number 853. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the Be with us as uh, we worship you, Father, and forgive us of all our many sins, Lord. I know that we fail you each and every day. We do ask for that forgiveness. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number 350. Number 350. As we come together around the Lord's table and remember our Lord's Savior's sacrifice that He gave on the cross for us. Number 350. When my love to Christ grows weak, when Lord He Yeah. 
this time, Heavenly Father, we would ask that you bless this loaf, which to us as Christians represents the body of Christ that hung on the cross for our sins. Help us, Heavenly Father, as we partake of this, that we do so in a worthy manner, in remembrance of him, as soon as we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Father in heaven, we come to you this time to ask you to bless this food of the vine, which represents Christ's shed blood <coughs> in the new covenant, and allow let us take the amount of belief in our sight and help us uh, understand better why Christ did this. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
come down to the end of another Lord's uh, table and come to the point where we set aside that uh, where we can get back a portion of what we received. Please bow with me. Father in heaven, we come to you this time to ask you to bless what we're about to give back to you and help us to a chip of heart and let it go to what you needed to go to. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, please mark your song books to number 934. Number 934, that would be the song of invitation. Softly and tender. The song before the last one would be number 470. 470. Let's sing the first and last verses of this song. If you would, please stand. I heard an old story How the Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood Good morning. Good morning. 
Psalms 118 says, Today is the day the Lord has made, and I will be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Amen. My name is Bert Standridge. I live north of Dover, and I worship at the uh, Shiloh Road Church of Christ in Russellville. I'm not a pulpit preacher. I'm not an elder. I'm not a deacon. I'm a Christian who loves the Word of God. Every word in this Bible is true. There are lies in the Bible, but they are recorded correctly. Okay? And that's what we need to know. Do you all like trivia? you like Bible trivia? Games? Eh, nobody's saying anything. But I'm going to ask you a trivia question anyhow. How many times in the Scriptures did people cross rivers or seas that had been parted for them and they walked across on dry land? I got a two, I got a two, I got a two, I got a two. Wow. What if I tell you the answer is four? Will you believe me? No. I'm, no I got to know. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. The answer is four. First of all, when Moses crossed the Red Sea, everybody remembers that, mm -hmm. Exodus 14. The second one was when Joshua mm -hmm. uh, crossed the Jordan, Joshua 3. The third one was when Elijah and Elisha crossed the Jordan to meet the fiery chariot in 2 Kings 2. The third, the fourth time is when Elisha come back across the river to get back in the promised land. They all crossed on dry ground. That always amazed me, that, that thought of dry ground. Because you can go to somewhere and it's been wet and, 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 and the, the, when, when the the moisture is gone. It's still muddy. When these people crossed, it wasn't muddy. <laughs> it was on dry ground. Now, just think about that. that that's just a wonderful miracle to me. <sighs> In today's text, we're going to see that this is a great a trivia question. Most would think that no lasting theological value, but then maybe there is some value to this. Okay? I want to see today what the, how everything in the scripture matters and it has a purpose. Okay? The Old Testament is full of types and shadows that reveal a glimpse of what God has in store for us in the New Testament. Nothing you read is without purpose and meaning, but you may have to dig to find it. Amen? You know, we should not just read the Bible, we need to ponder it. We need to think of that. We need to think about what it says in the verses and how it relates to other verses. Romans 15, 4 tells us, referring to the Old Testament scriptures, that everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Does the scriptures give you hope? Huh? It sure does, doesn't it? Makes you get along every day. So, how much of the Old Testament was written to encourage us and to give us hope? All of it. Every bit of it. Every word. Including these people who crossed these bodies of water. We're going to get back to them in a few minutes. First, let's lay a little foundation here. I want to talk about what the law could not do. And this is the law of Moses I'm talking about. Romans 15, 4 tells us as New Testament Christians that the Old Testament teaches us about God, encouragement, endurance, and hope. But as valuable as the Old Testament is to us, it does not have a means, does not mean that we are, we are to live our lives as the old people did. We do not worship like old, old Testament people did. Okay? If we did, I'd be up here sprinkling blood on y'all. And you would not like that. We'd be out there in that beautiful pavilion, burning animal sacrifices that would not remove our sin. Okay? We don't worship that way. Galatians 5.18 says, If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. It's Galatians 5.18. The Old Testament was a covenant, a contract that, that God established with Israel, and that contract, contract was based upon the law. The law had a flaw. It made no one righteous. The old law made no one righteous. Hebrews 7.19 says, 
The law made nothing perfect. If we live according to those commandments, we would never be good enough to get into heaven. The law's purpose was to expose our sinfulness and to reveal our need for Jesus. Okay? Without the old law, we would not know what sin is. It tells us, thou shalt not covet. Covet. So we know that that's a sin. We shall not lie. We know that that's a sin. Okay? Galatians 3.24 says, So the law put in charge, so the law was put in, in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. These Old Testament people, they walked by sight and we walk by faith. The difference between our two. We don't have to see what happened in the Old Testament to know that it's true. We do not have to see the miracles that Jesus performed because we know that it's true because we have the written word right here. The infallible written word of God is with us. Thus the law was given to Moses, thus it's called the law of Moses, and the law could never lead us to heaven. God drove home that very painful point in the Old Testament. The stories related to Deuteronomy 32, 48-52. On the same day the Lord took Moses, go up unto the Aram range, to Mount Nebo and Moab, across the Jordan, and view Canaan, the land that I am given the Israelites as their possession. There on the mountain that you climb, you will die and be gathered to your people, just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Horeb and was gathered to his people. Because both of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites in the waters of Merib and Kabesh in the desert of Zin, because you did not uphold my holiness among the Israelites. You will see that the land only from a distance, and you will not enter that land I am giving to the people of Israel. What a great Old Testament person Moses was. But God did not let him enter the promised land. What was his sin that was so great that he would not let him go into the promised land? The passage was saying that the reason Moses did not get into the promised land was because he had sinned against God. And Meribeth God told him to speak to the rock and it would bring forth water. Moses was angry at the people and struck the rock. The water came out, but the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, Because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you should not bring this assembly into the land I have given thee. Numbers 20 and 12. If you remember the first time that they brought forth water, God told Moses to strike the rock, and it brought forth water. The second time, he told him to speak to the rock. Moses was mad, did not do what God told him to do, and what was the outcome of that? He didn't get to go into the promised land. He led these people. He, he took them out of Egypt. Okay, He did all these miracles. He saw the burning bush. What a great man this was. And yet, his sin kept him out of what was called the land of rest. And the land of rest, it actually should have been translated the land of peace because that's what they were going to get once they took the land. It's going to be a land where they didn't have to build houses, they didn't have to plant vineyards because there's all ready for them. They just took it all over. Okay? Another interesting fact about that that always amazed me, that God sent forth hornets to drive the people that were there out. It says that three times in the Old Testament. Can you imagine that? Hornets coming and running you out of your house. But that's what God did for these people. Okay? Let's continue on. We don't treat God as holy if we don't do exactly how He has instructed. We do not Treat God as holy unless we do everything that He has instructed. How did He instruct us to worship today on the first day of the week? There's things that we have to do, and it's got to be done in this building, okay? With the ecclesia, the called out. If we don't do it exactly how He says to do it, what's God going to do? You think God is going to let that slide? You think God is going to let it slide if we don't have communion? He's not. You think he's going to let it slide if we don't sing? 
He's not. Okay? If we don't take up an offering, like the example that we get from the apostles, he's not going to be happy with that. We have to do exactly what God tells us to do. And if you don't believe that, there's another Old Testament scripture you should look at. Look at uh, Leviticus 10.1, where it talks about Nahab and Abihu. They offered strange fire before the Lord, and fire came out from the Lord and consumed them. It consumed them. We need to be on our toes that we worship God correctly in accordance with His Word, His written Word, His infallible written Word. By men's standard, what Moses did was, was a very small indiscretion. Moses lived 120 years, and this one incident keeps him out of the promised land. Others have done worse, and they got in. That's not fair. But this isn't really about fairness, is it? Mm -mm. It's about God using Moses as an object lesson. Moses was one of the greatest servants of God in the Old Testament, a man unparalleled in righteousness and obedience, but even this great man in sin and the law brought down from Mount Sinai couldn't remove that sin. God's point. Even a tiny sin keeps us out of heaven, but there's another lesson. Not only could the smallest sin keep you out of heaven, the law can't get you into heaven. You see that Moses represents the law, so it's called the law of Moses, and God chose not to let Moses into the promised land, partly because he wanted to teach us that just as the, as the giver of the law could not enter the promised land, the same law would, not be, would be unable to let anyone else into heaven. So we had to have something different. Moses wasn't allowed to lead Israel into this new land. Who did? Joshua. What is the Greek name for Joshua? It's Jesus. What does the word Jesus mean? Savior. The law was not permitted to take people into the promised land, but Joshua the Savior could lead them in. It's just a shadow of what was to come. It's just a glimpse of what was to come. Romans 8.3 says... For the law could not do, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. When Joshua led the people into the promised land, God parted the Jordan River so that they could cross the riverbed on dry ground, and Joshua leads the people of Israel across the river, exactly the same place that Elijah and Elisha would cross. Think that's a coincidence? You think anything in the Bible is a coincidence? It's not. Everything has its purpose. Now let's talk about, talk about what the prophets could not do. Okay? In 2 Kings 2 7, 2 Kings 2 7 and 8, it says, Now fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Elijah took his men and folded it together and struck the waters, and they were divided here and there, so the two, two men crossed over on dry ground. And then 11 through 14 reads, 2 Kings again, As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it and called out, My father, my father the chariots of Israel, and its horsemen. He saw Elijah no more, and he took off his own clothes and tore them into pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the banks of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah and that fell from him and struck the waters and said, Where is the Lord, O God of Elijah? And when he had struck the waters, they were divided here, and there Elisha crossed over. Elijah and Elisha are at the Jordan River. Elijah, as <coughs> already mentioned, was in the land of Israel, the promised land. But when it came time for him to be taken up to the world, then where did he go? He went outside the promised land. Okay? Why does God have Elisha do that? 
<coughs> because Elisha represents the, the prophets of the Old Testament. And the Jews depended upon the law and the prophets to bring them into righteousness. God's message, neither the law nor the prophets could bring us into God's rest. Elijah doesn't cross back into the promised land, but someone else does. Who's that? The waters part so he can walk back into God's land. That's Elisha. What does Elisha's name mean? God is our salvation. Do you see what God's doing here? God's using the same imagery as he did with Moses and Joshua. Moses and Elijah both died outside the promised land. Neither the law nor the prophets could bring people to salvation. But Joshua the Savior and Elijah, God is salvation, could. We need a Savior which will bring us out of the wilderness of sin into God's presence. And hallelujah, we have it. Don't we? What can Jesus do for us? <clears throat> now to drive the fact home during his ministry on earth, Jesus took three of his closest disciples with him to a meeting on what is called the Mount of Transfiguration. And if you look at my, my favorite version of that, it's in, it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Is the one that's in Matthew 17, verse, and it says in verse 5, and this is Peter, he said, let us uh, build three tabernacles, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elisha. Okay? And when he spoke, behold, a, a bright cloud overshadowed them. This is from 17.5, Matthew 17.5. While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. Hear ye Him. Not hear the prophets. Not hear Moses. Hear ye Him. Jesus Christ. Now to drive the fact home of his ministry on earth, Jesus took three of his friends and went on the Mount of Transfiguration. We read that. Then he met with two Old Testament people. Do you remember those? Who the two old people, the Old Testament men were? Moses and Elijah. The last time we saw these men in the Old Testament, they were outside of the Promised Land. But now, the Mount of Transfiguration, they're inside the Promised Land. The only reason that they're in the promised land now is because Jesus brought them there. They needed a Savior to bring them into God's land. Now isn't that cool? It's intriguing. But you say, Bert, you said in Romans 15, 4, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. What you have shared about Moses and Elijah is intriguing, but how does that encourage me and how does that give me hope? Does it give you hope when we talk about these things? Skeptics would say that the Bible is a collection of fables and that the, description is not, the scriptures is nothing more than the writing of a clever man who wanted a book to use for a, religious, for a religion they created for their own purposes. The Bible was written for us. It was written for me, the sinner that I am. It was written for me. It was written for you, everyone. Everyone here, it's written for, it's written for, un, for people who are not Christian to bring them to Christ. So they make up all the things and so they make up all the things that you read. But what we just stated about Moses and Elijah provides that that's not true. The Bible is not some modestly collected men's teaching. The whole Bible works together to tell one story. Everything matters. It is an elaborately intricate book that weaves God's thinking throughout every story found in its pages, even down to the smallest details. The stories in the scripture are not just there to entertain you. They are there to assure you that you matter to God. I matter to God. 
I was baptized when I was 31 years old and I was the world's worst sinner. And I happened to get stationed in a place, <clears throat> Arco, Idaho, where the shortstop <laughs> on the softball team I played for was, was the Church of Christ preacher. I met the man. We cut wood together. We did things together. We had Bible studies together. And the more he said, the more I couldn't say no. How do you say no to the truth of God? You don't. Not if you're honest with yourself. So I was baptized in the Little Lost River in Arco, Idaho. On a November night that was freezing cold, my wife lost a shoe in the river. Uh, anyhow, the message of the crossing of the Jordan is there to assure us that God cares so much for us that he took extreme care to give us the Bible that is reliable even down to the smallest details. The purpose of getting such a re reliable book was to drive home and, and repeated message, you need a Savior, you need Jesus. Can we be saved without Jesus? No. Can we be saved without obeying the gospel of Christ? No. All these books that men, there's volumes of books that men write about the Bible. Volume. There's commentators, just all kinds of commentators everywhere. But let me tell you something about commentators. Every one of them is wrong in something. Not in all things, but in something. Every one of them is wrong. You need this book, not what some man tells you about this book. Okay? I'll get off my soapbox. <clears throat> God loved you. He repeated that message in his Bible over and over again. And he provided a way, a Savior. But there's more. When Elijah crossed over the Jordan, he laid the cloak on the water and crossed into the wilderness. He crossed from the promised land into a land of rock and sand, the desert. He literally crossed over from a, a region of life into a region of death. Incidents like this have influenced our language. It is used <coughs> when people are saying, talk about dying, they describe it as crossing over or crossing the river. We hear that language all the time. And those outside of Christ view that place to which they were crossing over as being a one-way trip. For them, death was a scary and final destination, a dark place filled with nothing but sorrow and misery. One ancient philosopher wrote, there is hope for those who are alive, but those who are dead are without hope. That's where Elijah was in the land without hope and darkness on the other side of the Jordan. There in that land, God waited for Elijah. If that's where you are, God is waiting for you. God has a ride waiting for you. And not just any ride, but a, fairy, a fiery chariot is waiting for you. Not a Toyota Venza like i got to drive. Okay? God has a lot better way for you to get to heaven. The vehicle design was to catch our attention and to impress us when he went up in the whirlwind. From that day to this, the fiery chariot represented the power of God over death. People confused the place of the chariot and the whirlwind, but remember the old Negro spiritual that went this way. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Well, I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? Coming for to carry me home. It was a band of angels coming after me, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, he said this, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fell asleep or grieved like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that, that we who are still alive, who are left to the coming of the Lord, will certainly not receive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven 
with the command and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And after that, we, we who are alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with those words. There's going to be a resurrection. Amen? And there's a resurrection of righteousness and a resurrection of the damned. And we, as human beings, have to make that choice. And God gives us a choice. We're the only animals that God gives a choice to. Every animal that God made, every one of them without exception does exactly what God made him to do. A dog barks. Okay? Every animal does exactly what he's supposed to do. But humans, on the other hand, God gave us a, a free will. He gave us a choice. God made us to worship Him. We are made for His good pleasure, it tells us in Revelations 4. We are made for God's own pleasure. But yet we fight God. We don't need to be doing it. One man put it this way. For the Christian, death is not a period, but a comma in the story of life. And God has given us that promise from the day we became Christians. Romans 6, 3-5 reads, Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. Amen. Amen. In baptism, we cross over from death to life, just as Elisha did when he returned to the promised land. Baptism teaches us that when we go down into the water, our past is buried with Christ. What would the person think he was being baptized when you put him down in the water and just left him there? You think he'd like that? I don't think so. He wants to be raised up. Okay? We raise them up. And it's symbolism for raising them from the dead. Okay? That's because baptism isn't just a promise that God forgives sins. Baptism is a promise that God will raise us up one day from the grave and we will be with the Lord forever. We can be with the Lord forever. And you know, we can choose where we go. You can go to the smoking section or you can go to the non-smoking section. It's up to you. Make your choice. Okay? You do it on your own. It's all on you. Okay? you got to make your choice. God provides us the way across the Red Sea and across the Jordan River and across the threshold of death. The crossing of the water and spirits in the scripture is a metaphor that God that teaches us that God offers us hope and encouragement just as Romans 15 promised. And we know that it's true because when Jesus rose from the dead, he showed us that death could not hold us either. Death cannot hold us either. We are going to be alive again. And we're going to live for eternity. How long is eternity? It's forever. It's forever and a day. You know, this is just short life. I can remember in 1968 when I went to boot camp and I landed in San Diego, California and they put me underneath a stenciling table at 3 o'clock in the morning. At 6 o'clock in the morning they come by kicking me, bam, bam, waking me up, telling me to go to chow. And they kicked me for 28 years. <coughs> now it seems like it was just that. And I've been retired longer than I was in. But it's just, life's gone. You all know that. Some of you do, some of you don't. Some of you will realize, will realize that later on. Okay? But life is short. We, make it, we need to make our decisions now where we're going to go. 2 Corinthians tells us that today is the, is the acceptable day of salvation. Okay? The only thing that we can make a difference to those who experience things like death or, 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 or a, a spouse who's, who's sitting by a, a grave 
or someone gets the word that your child is dead or your father is dead, it's knowing that, that Jesus will be with us and that there will be a resurrection. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Revelation 21, 4. The fact is, all we need is Jesus Christ. All we need to do is obey the gospel. That's all you have to do. It's just that easy. Life is not going to get any easier. I'm not saying that. But I guarantee you, life as a Christian is better than life as a non-Christian because I've been there. Okay? I like it a whole lot better waking up in the morning instead of coming to in the morning. I like going to sleep at night and not passing out at night. Okay? Life is better as a Christian. I don't have to worry about who my friends are. I know who they are. They're good people and they will do anything for me. Okay? My Christian brothers and sisters are just wonderful people. The people I used to hang out with, they didn't care about me. Not a bit. I was just another sailor, another drunken sailor like to spend money. Of course, I, I did spend my own money, not somebody else's, like the government does. Anyhow, you have the opportunity now to come forward as we sing an invitation song. A song. If you have needs, if you need to be baptized, if you need the, the, the prayers of the congregation, and I'm sure if you have any physical needs, this congregation will also help you. So please come as we stand and sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the waters, He's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home.
merciful Father in heaven, we ask that our worship service this morning is pleasing in your sight. Father, we pray for those amongst us that were not able to be with us this morning. We ask that you'd uh, help them to find their right place. And if they couldn't be here because of uh, physical ailments, Father, we pray that you'd uh, bless them and better help them. Now, Father, we ask that as we become discouraged and disillusioned with the world around us, that we pick up your written word gain the hope and the strength that comes from it. Father, at this time we ask forgiveness for our many sins. We realize that uh, you don't expect us to be perfect, but that you expect us to keep trying to obey your, all your commandments. And Father, because we're not perfect, we just thank you so much for giving us the avenue to uh, join you someday. That avenue through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, as we depart from this building, we ask that you uh, be with us through the rest of the walk of our life. That you help to keep us on the path, the path that leads to salvation. All this we ask in your son's name. Amen. Amen.